My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Sometimes Jesus' disciples give me hope. For as much as I struggle to understand Jesus, they seem to struggle all the more. Despite walking and eating with Jesus and hearing his stories and teachings, the disciples just don't seem to get it. The Gospels are replete with stories of disciples confused and baffled by Jesus' teaching. In some instances, their misunderstanding is comical. The Gospel writers, Mark in particular, almost portray them as clueless. Today's Gospel is just one such occasion. Jesus gathers his followers together and proceeds to share with them that for him to be glorified, he must suffer and die. Jesus baffles his listeners. They even seem embarrassed or even afraid to admit that they don't get Jesus. Yet I almost want to ask them, what part of dying do you not get? Isn't it obvious what Jesus is talking about? To make matters worse, the disciples not only seem not to understand Jesus, they proceed to have a ridiculous debate among themselves of which among them is the greatest. Do they really have no clue? Jesus talks about death, and they talk about greatness. Well, it might be easy for us to laugh at the disciples' inability to grasp Jesus' message. I suspect we're not at all that much more different. We have to remember that we're reading this story with full knowledge of how it will end. They, on the other hand, are caught up in the events, and Jesus' words contradict much of the religious and cultural belief of their day. Their doubt and confusion is an honest reaction to Jesus. Their master and teacher seems to be speaking in ways unfamiliar to them. Jesus' teaching also seems to undermine the significance of two earlier events in the life of the community. In the chapter and verses preceding the story we heard today, Jesus is acclaimed by Peter as a Messiah, and Jesus was transfigured before them on top of the mountain and stood with the two great prophets of the Jewish tradition, Moses and Elijah. From what they could see, Jesus was fulfilling everything they knew and understood about the Messiah. But now he tells them he must suffer and die in order to rise again. It's no wonder why they're dumbfounded by Jesus' words. The disciples, like many in Israel at the time, longed for a king to free and liberate the people of Israel from the oppression and bondage of foreign rulers. And in this case, the Romans. For centuries, the people have endured one occupation after another. Those that took control of their land often disregarded the people's deeply long-held faith in the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Moses. They yearned for a king, a king like that of David of old, to rise up and free the people. And now they believed their Messiah stood before them. What they got, however, is not the king they initially had hoped for. Instead, their long-awaited king and Messiah tells them that they must suffer and die in order that they might be willing, in order to live 
and that they must be willing to do the same. It's no wonder why Jesus' followers were so lost and confused. Given their preconceived notions of messiahship and kingship, it's no wonder why the disciples began to debate with one another of which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They thought they would be standing next to a warrior king. Yet Jesus again challenges their long-held assumptions. He draws a child close to himself and tells them that whoever welcomes one such child in his name welcomes him. Now this is where we fail to understand Jesus. While we may get to one degree or another Jesus' teaching that he must suffer and die in order to rise again, we tend to misunderstand the significance of Jesus drawing the children to himself. We have become so accustomed to thinking of Jesus as meek and mild that we have made Jesus into a person of our own liking. Thus, the story conjures up sentimental images and feelings of Jesus, sweet images of a kind and wonderful figure. Just as the disciples couldn't let go of their own religious and cultural assumptions, so too we are incapable of setting aside our own assumptions of Jesus and embrace the Jesus of the Gospels. For us, and for many of us, our image and understanding of Jesus has been formed by centuries of religious artwork that depicts him as this fair and mild figure, and not the radical figure that he was. Consider for a moment the artistic portrayals of Jesus drawing the children to himself. The images lead us to believe that Jesus surrounded himself with children because of their innocence and simplicity. Unlike the adults, the children understand Jesus in the way of gentleness, patience, and kindness that we are called to live. There's one such example of this in our own church. In fact, if you get a chance today, maybe walk to the back of the church and you'll see in one of the windows this very image depicted of Jesus gathering the children to himself. It's right back in the corner. You probably walk in here hundreds of times and probably have never noticed it. It's a beautiful window. But I'm sorry to break the news to you. That's that's not what Jesus is trying to convey in this passage. And by bringing the children close to himself. Instead, Jesus uses a child to illustrate a point that God is closest to those whom society considers as nothing. To understand this, we need to understand the culture of Jesus' day and the original language in which this text was written. In the Greco-Roman culture of Jesus' day, children were non-persons, non-persons, who had no legal right or status on their own. In fact, I came across one text in which it was an instruction to a father that if his house caught on fire, he was first to save his elder parents, then his wife, and if he still had a chance, to get the children. That's how little they were considered at the time. Moreover, the Greek and Aramaic words for child can also mean slave and servant. Thus, by drawing Jesus to himself, Jesus affirms the biblical tradition that God is closest to those whom the world rejects. Not only is God closest to the rejected and ignored, God is identified with them. Thus, if you want to get close to God, you must be at one with those whom the world rejects ignores and despises. If you want to be first, then you must be the servant to the least of them all. 
it is unclear to us as to how Jesus' listeners received his teaching. Mark tells us nothing about their response. In fact, the story strangely just ends with this and then proceeds on to something new, ever so characteristic, by the way, of Mark. Instead, he moves on with the story and proceeds to relate to us additional teachings of Jesus. Yet I wouldn't interpret Mark's silence as insignificant. Mark has a clever way of drawing us into the story and challenging us to consider how we receive Jesus' teaching. By remaining silent, silent, Mark is basically saying to you, what are you going to do about this? He doesn't want to give us an answer. He wants you and I to wrestle. How are you going to draw the least among us to yourself, as Jesus does? How do you serve the least among us? How do we welcome those whom the world rejects, ignores, and despises? Do we cross to the other side of the street when we see somebody in need or somebody who we really don't care about? Do we dismiss the stories of the oppressed because they make us uncomfortable? Or do we make a point of going to the places that make us uncomfortable and listen and care for those whom the world has forgotten? Well, I think many of us, myself included, like to think of ourselves as people who go to the margins of society and care for the persons rejected and ignored by the world. I'm not sure that's always the case. I often worry that we avoid sitting with the Jesus who disturbs us and makes us uncomfortable. Perhaps this Sunday is a time for us to really listen to what Jesus says and honestly ask ourselves, how do we serve the least among us? Amen.